Is this where we uh, we need to start today? So we said covenants are things. By the way, who writes the bond indenture? Is it the borrower or the lender? That's the borrower. We said that there's one borrower, many lenders. So it has to be the borrower. So it's the borrower that's putting these covenants in there. And we said that the covenants, they're going to choose to put covenants in there that represent things that they would or wouldn't do anyway that's going to reduce risk for the bondholders. In other words, the lenders. So as a result, we're reducing the risk to the lenders. What should that do to the required return? Yeah, it should lower it, and that's going to lower the cost of borrowing for the bond uh, issuer. Okay, so negative covenants. These are things that you're not supposed to do. Things you're not supposed to do. And the first one is to limit dividend payments. Limit dividend payments, usually to a maximum percentage of earnings per share. Now, let's ask this question. Why would the bondholders be interested in the firm limiting dividend payments? Do bondholders receive dividends? <coughs> Why are the bondholders interested in... Could it oh, you're shaking his legs. Could it devalue the, the bonds? Okay, and you're right. You're heading in the right direction. What is necessary to pay bond coupons? It's a simple answer. You probably have some in your pocket. Cash, right? You gotta have cash. Now, if you pay dividends to many, by the way, where do dividends come out of? Cash, right? And so if you were to pay too much in dividends, you might not be able to pay your coupons, you might not be able to pay the face value at the end. Also, uh, if, and remember, people are scumbags. So here's the ultimate scumbag move. I'm going to go out and issue a bunch of bonds, and I don't put that covenant in there. And I'm going to immediately turn around and pay out a huge dividend to my shareholders, and then declare bankruptcy. Where are you as a bondholder at that point? You're in a world of hurt, right? I don't don't know if there's any way you can claw back the dividend that was paid out. That's one. That's the other reason that we do this. Firms must limit, limit dividend payments. Now let's talk about the second one. The firm cannot pledge assets to other lenders. So uh, we talked about security last time, and uh, so the problem here is if I take a, a factory and I use it as security for one bond then those people have an expectation that if I don't pay those bonds, they can take possession of the factory. But what if I take that factory and I pledge it to another, uh, a security to another bond? Well, then there turns out to be a huge fight if there's a bankruptcy. And so this is why they would say, uh, you can't pledge your assets to another lender, the same assets that are underlying this loan. Let's talk about, give, give a real like, world example here. I have a house. Let's say I have a house and it's worth $350,000. And I go to bank number one and I say, would you loan me? Was that you? Shame. Yeah. Go ahead. So would that be kind of like considered collateral? Yeah. So we would use, that's the colloquial term that we would use. Remember with bonds, collateral has more specific meaning. Do you remember that? No. Okay, it was a, it's a basket of securities, okay, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, so this, uh, we're, we're talking about pledging this asset, so, we would, so when I borrow money to buy a car, I pledge the car as the security. So I could go and I could borrow $250,000 against this house that I own outright. And if I don't pay, then the bank can come and take the house, and they're probably gonna be okay because the house is worth more than they loaned to me on it. But what if I could go to a second bank and somehow convince them also to loan me $250,000? And then I go to a third bank. Now as long as I, and do the same thing, as long as I'm making the payments to all three banks, does anybody care? No. When are they gonna figure, the pro figure out the problem? Yeah, and by the way, people that are pulling this scam, how many payments do they make before they stop? Well, very few, right? They do as little as possible because after all, it's cash and just into the hole for them. And so what do they do? They take the money and run. 
And then all three uh, bankers show up on the porch at the same time. And then there's a three-way fist fight. By the way, this is what a three-way fist fight looks like. When they're like, hey, wait a minute, it's my house. No, it's my house. And so they have to fight over this. Now, it's not nearly that physical when you get into the corporate world, but you do have all these people lining up at bankruptcy and say, wait a minute, that factory is pledged to us. And you end up with lots of legal battles. And so if we say don't pledge assets to other lenders, it makes things simpler. Bankruptcy makes it more likely you get your money back, lowers your risk, and therefore lowers the required return. Then we have, they cannot merge with another firm. Now, by the way, I want to remind you that this is like a buffet. It's like a buffet, and you can choose which ones you're going to put in there. And not every firm will be able to put that one in there. So, for instance, General Electric. General Electric's business model is to continually buy and sell businesses. And when they buy them, that's considered a merger. It's through the acquisition process. As a result, you won't ever see GE put that third covenant in there. You won't ever see them do that. And it's simply because that's their business model. They can. But if it's not my business model, then it probably will help me to pledge not to merge with another firm, especially if my firm is safe. And let me demonstrate to you why that is. I have a dairy farm. You guys know what a dairy farm? Actually, I have a dairy. I have not only the cows, I've got the dairy. I sell milk to the local school district. It's all very safe. And I go out to borrow money, and you guys are willing to loan me money at 4% because my thing is just so safe. Now, my brother-in-law has a business cleaning up nuclear disasters. So he's got people right now at Fukushima trying to clean up what happened there. And his business is somewhat riskier. So his bondholders require an 8% yield to maturity. Now, my brother-in-law and I get together over Thanksgiving dinner, and we're talking about our businesses, and, and he's like, hey, maybe we should merge our businesses together. Now, assuming they're about the same size, uh, I say, yeah, no, no worries, we'll do that. We merge our businesses. Now, the overall firm is riskier than the dairy was by itself, but safer than the nuclear waste cleanup firm was by itself. So what does that mean to the new required yield to maturity? It's probably going to be around 6%. And so the people who own the 4% bonds, who bought the bonds when they were 4% yield to maturity, what's going to happen to the value of their bonds when the yield to maturity rises to 6%? What happens? Yeah, their value is going down. Now, what happens, though, to the bondholders at the risky firm? The value of their bonds goes up. It is purely a transfer of wealth from the risky firm bondholders to the safe, or from the safe bondholders to the risky firm bondholders. It's simply a transfer of wealth from the safe bondholders to the risky bondholders. Now, if you're if you own both bonds of both companies, you really don't care. But how many people do you think that would be interested in buying my safe bonds would be interested in buying my brother-in-law's risky bonds? Probably a different clientele. And so this is one of the reasons that I might not pledge, or I might pledge not to merge with another firm, especially if I am a safe firm. Does that make sense? Okay. Firm cannot sell or lease major assets without lender approval. By the way, if I have a bond that's, even, that's not even uh, secured by anything at the firm other than the general assets of the firm, I still want them uh, to not sell or lease those major assets because, think about this, what, they, what could they do? They could sell major assets, pay on a dividend, and then declare bankruptcy. And when I come to collect my money at bankruptcy, there isn't any. And so I'm going to say to them, well, I'm, I know I'm buying unsecured debt here, but you need to promise not to sell or lease your major assets without our approval. So I will tell you one, a, a, another true story. This one is, you know, I told you about my buddy that used to work at Calpine. And they actually issued some bonds that were backed by two power plants because they were an electric company. 
backed by two power plants. And then they got a really tempting offer for those two power plants from someone else, and they just up and sold the power plants. What do you think the bondholders thought about that? They, pay, they offered lower, uh, ri so lower risk bond because it's secured, so they're not getting as much return for that. The coupon rate's lower. And now, Calpine has sold the security out from under them. What suddenly happens to the riskiness of those bonds? Goes up. So the yield of maturity goes up. What happens then to the value of the bonds? Yeah, they gotta go down. And so this is actually the true story. They forced Calpine into bankruptcy because that was a violation of uh, one of the covenants was that they couldn't sell the underlying security, which makes perfect sense. When you uh, sell a car, and when you're trading in a car, what is, before you get any money, what do they do first? They always pay the car off. And let's say you just sell your car to the dealer. If you're going to get 22000 out of it, they say, well, wait a minute, but you owe 20000 we're going to pay that off first, and then you get the 2000 that's left over. So what if you borrow money to buy a car, and then you just go sell the car on the street for cash? You think that might be a violation of the loan terms? Yeah, because you're supposed to pay off the loan, right? Okay, now let's see. Firms cannot issue additional long-term debt. This is one that you won't see very often because firms want to maintain their ability to go out there and issue new bonds. In fact, I'll use GE again. GE is out there frequently issuing new bonds. By the way, why do you think companies continually issue new bonds? What are they doing with the money? Okay, so they could be out there investing in new projects, right? But what else are they doing? I'll give you a hint. The United States government does the very same thing. Yeah, we're using new debt to pay off old debt. Now, it sounds kind of hinky, but this is how business is done. Typically, the, the debt isn't going to be paid down, and if you uh, look into capital structure, you'll see that every uh, industry has an optimal capital structure, meaning the percent of debt in their capital structure. And if you, over time, uh, pay debt off your debt, then you are going to be floating away from that optimal capital structure. So it makes perfect sense that these companies are going to go out there and issue new debt. So why, though, would you as a bondholder be interested in them not issuing additional long-term debt? Let's say that I, I go to Mr. Salas Hernandez and I borrow $300,000 from him. Oh, for shame, late. Thank you for your assistance, class. <laughs> we, we arranged that in advance. Okay. Okay, so um, why would you not be interested in me going out and borrowing more money from someone else? Right now, you are the only person I owe money to. Who is the first person I'm going to pay whenever I get money? You. Now, I also... I borrow money from you. Do you see how now I'm like, hmm, right? So the end, maybe I've got plenty of cash flow to cover both of those. But now the risk has risen because now instead of one set of fixed payments, I've got two sets of fixed payments that I have to make. Does that make sense? Whenever I go to, to uh, refinance my mortgage, they always ask, uh, what are all your debts? And mine's easy. It's just the house, right? That's it. And my uh, loan officer loves it. He says, look, he says, your, your stuff all fits on one page. And I said, how many pages of debts do people typically have? He says, well, I've seen seven and more, right? Seven pages of listing of their debts. Who do you think is more likely to make their mortgage payment? Me or uh, Mrs. Seven Pages of Debt? me, right? And so I would totally be interested in my uh, borrower not borrowing additional money because it means that I'm more likely to get paid. Now let's talk about positive covenants. These are things that you have to do. So the first one is to maintain, by the way, what does NWC stand for? Networking capital. Networking capital is current assets minus current liabilities. 
why would the uh, bondholders be interested in you maintaining your networking capital at or above a certain minimum level? Yeah, so we want you to have enough money not only to pay us, the bondholders, but we want you to be able to pay all of your other debts. Did you know that not only the banks and the bondholders can push you into bankruptcy, suppliers can too. Suppliers can push you into bankruptcy too. And so not only do I want to make sure you've got enough money to pay my coupon, I want, you, I want to make sure that you've got enough money to pay your suppliers and all your other short-term obligations because I don't want to get dragged into bankruptcy just because you aren't paying your suppliers. And so I'm going to say, well, wait a minute, I'd like for you to maintain your networking capital at or above a certain minimum level. By the way, as a lender, I am thrilled for them to hold all sorts of networking capital, right? As a shareholder, I wouldn't be because cash is a poor investment. Remember, cash has low returns compared to going out there and building a new factory or opening a new Target, you know, the store, not the round thing. Okay, now, how though are we going to know if they are maintaining the networking capital at or above a certain minimum level? Do we just take their word for it? By the way, people are scumbags. Do we just take their word for it? Absolutely not. What's that? The reports. Yeah, we're going to ask them. And, well, and this, keep in mind, this is people are, are saying they're going to do this stuff anyway. This is in their uh, covenant. And if they're a public traded firm, the second one here is not a big deal, right? Because they have to submit their audited financial statements every three months to the United States Securities and Exchange Commission. They have to make that available, so they might as well put it into their bond covenant. They're going to be providing these audited financial statements. Now, two reasons that we want to know, or two things to know about this. Number one, financial statements. We said you got to have the financial statements in order to know the financial condition of the company and the networking capital level to see if they're uh, violating that first covenant. But the other thing to note is that they have to be audited financial statements. Why audited? By the way, what does audited even mean? Signed by the CEO and board. Okay, so uh, since Sarbanes Oxley, the audited financial statements must be signed by the CFO and the CEO attesting to their, uh, that they're truthful, right? But the auditing process, what is auditing? I'm going to ask Canada. He's looking sleepy. Canada, when we say that financial statements are audited, what do we mean? Yeah, so they're reviewed by a third party. So, not the bondholder, not the company, but a third party, usually one of the big four accounting firms if you're a public like Fortune 500 company. Okay, now, let's talk about, uh, why, so why, why would auditing be important? Why would you trust audited financial statements more than you would trust non-audited ones? Because someone with non-interest in it reviewed it. Okay, so do we think that maybe there's a little more probability that there's some truth to it? Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about uh, the non-audited financial statements. I have a, a friend who's a business broker, and he's always having people come in with their non-audited financial statements and wanting him to sell their company based on those non-audited financial statements. And he says, I'll tell you what, bring your tax forms in. Why do you think he's asking to see their tax forms? It's harder to lie on your taxes. Than yeah, so if you lie on your non-audited financial statements, which are basically until you go to sell the company just for your own personal use, uh, not a big deal. But if you lie to the government on your taxes, what could happen? You could go to jail. Remember, jail's bad. Yeah, you know, if you need a reminder, let me know. I'll bring my buddy in. And he'll tell you about the four thread count sheets that he slept on at Camp Fed. Okay, back to the story. Um, let's say, uh, well, then we know that audited would be more likely to be true, but can you trust audited financial statements? Ish, right? You can trust them more than non audited financial statements. 
But let me tell you a real life experience that I lived through. It would have been the end of 1997. The end of 1997, I met Halliburton. I'm in Dallas, Texas. I'm on the shop floor. I'm a production supervisor. And I see this young guy who's like 23 years old, and he's walking through the shop floor, and he's got on a suit, a tie, and shiny shoes. That is not what shop floor attire is. So I'm right off the bat, I know something's up. And then I see this guy come up to him from the warehouse. The warehouse at the time, those guys were making around $11. My machinists were making between 15 and 17. So we're talking about a really kind of low level guy. And apparently he, uh, he was kind of miffed at the company. And he goes up to the young man and he says, are you the accountant? And the young man says, well, yes, yes I am. You know, because he's straight out of accounting school. He's still excited. And the, the warehouse guy says, I think there's something on the back dock that you might want to see. And so the, uh, him and the accountant take off for the back dock. And you know, being curious, I follow them. And here's what happened. The warehouseman pointed to all of this inventory that was sitting on the back dock that we hadn't accepted on in, we hadn't accepted it yet, so it wasn't showing up on our books. Why would we do that? Any idea? And I'll give you a hint, people are scumbags. Okay, so, but the, the, the inventory is there, right? It's just a matter of having it show up on the books. Why would we not want the inventory to show up on the books? It turns out that our uh, executives were rewarded based on inventory terms. That was one of their targets. How do you get your inventory terms up? You lower your inventory. So every December we would go through an exercise called draining the swamp, where we would try to ship out as much as we possibly humanly could, and then, yeah, maybe we're not going to accept the stuff into our inventory. By the way, pushing all this, shipping all the stuff that you can is perfectly fine. What about not accepting the stuff into your inventory? That's not okay. Okay, now, the, uh, the young accountant, and keep in mind this is 1997, that's before we have phones with cameras on them. So he gets out his little disposable camera, and he's, you guys know these where you have to wind it with your thumb and take the pictures? He's taking all sorts of pictures, and, and then I see him. He pulls out his phone, but of course it's 1997, so the phone's huge. And he says, hey, I found this thing, and he's calling these other places in the company. And then he runs into, or he, uh, the, the, the other guy that's in charge at our facility for their, at this audit, he, he's out there on the shop floor with him. He says, look, they haven't been accepting the inventory in. And here's what the boss says. He says, oh, I'm sure it's just limited to this facility. It's not material. What does not material mean? Doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, it's, it's not big enough to matter. Not big enough for anyone to care about. And this is when the junior accountant says, aha, I thought you might say that. So I have also called their facilities in Duncan, Oklahoma, Houston, Texas, um, Arboruth, uh, Scotland, and in, uh, in uh, where were we? It was... Liberia. <laughs> we were in all sorts of Angola. We were in all sorts of places. And and the word was the same everywhere. All these people were doing these audits simultaneously around the globe. Everywhere the inventory was sitting there. <sighs> so now the boss is a little concerned, right? Because he's got something real to report. And so he calls down to and by the way, it was Arthur Anderson, the people that did the in run uh, accounting, they were our accountants. So that gives you a hint, right? Okay, so he calls down to Houston and, and shares this information. And the, the guy in Houston, now I, I strongly suspect the next part because I wasn't there for, to hear that. So I strongly suspect that the guy in Houston gets a hold of his contact at Halliburton to let him know what's going on. And you know what the contact at Halliburton says? Probably something like this. Thank you so much for bringing this to our attention. We will investigate the matter. By the way, we're thinking about hiring a different auditor. Do you have any recommendations? Do you start to see the conflict of interest? Yeah. The people that are paying for the audit are also the same ones that you're supposed to be digging up the dirt on. 
what do you think keeps accounting companies in business? Uh, the fees from their audit clients or the good feeling knowing that they uh, exposed wrongdoing? Mm -hmm. uh, we know for sure with Arthur Anderson what the answer was because Enron, right? And they're no longer around. Long story short, do you think this showed up in the audit report? Not at all. Not at all. Do you think it was material? Absolutely it was material. But it didn't show up because of this conflict of interest. Okay, so can I trust audited statements? No. Can I trust them more than non-audited non -audited statements? Absolutely. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Firm must maintain any collateral or security in good condition. Why would that be important? So let's take it down to the consumer level. The uh, bank owns, loans you money to buy a car. Why would they care whether you change the oil in the car on a regular basis? Why? So it maintains the same value? Yeah, we want that thing to maintain as much value as possible because if you don't pay, then we're going to have to take that car away and we're going to have to sell it to try to get our money back. And if the car is trashed, we might not get enough money back. Uh, in fact, I, I knew a guy in my hometown, and what he did was go around and buy these repossessed cars. Do you think people realize that they are going to eventually lose a car? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And so what? Uh, do they keep changing the oil? No. Do they put new tires on them? No. In fact, a lot of them, because we know people are scumbags, what do you think they'll do with the car? Crash it. Yeah, they just drive the crap out of it. They're like throwing roadkill in the trunk and all sorts of other yeah. stuff. What do you think happens then? Well, the banks, the banks still got to sell it, but they're going to take a bath on it. And this guy in my hometown actually specialized in buying these cars and refurbishing them and selling them. And that's how he made his money. Okay, so that's why we want you to maintain any collateral or security in good condition. So, what would be the analogy? What if you have a, a gas turbine that you're using to provide um, power to one of your factories? We might say that you must follow the maintenance guidelines that are given by the manufacturer. And then that they must be, and you want to have a third party inspector go in there and make sure that they're actually doing that. So this could be another covenant that would be put in there. Any questions about covenants? Okay, now let's go on and talk about bond ratings. The text says that the bond rating is actually a measure of default risk. But it's actually more than that. It's a combination of default risk and the probability of recovery given default. What is recovery? The firm taking it back. Yeah, so we're talking about the ability to get your money back, right? The ability to get your money back. And so we could have two firms, both with the same likelihood of default, but one of them, there is a higher probability of recovery because the assets of that firm are tangible assets. What are tangible assets? Yeah, things you can touch, right? So plant, property, equipment. If I can touch it, I can take it, I can sell it. What about uh, intangible assets? Right. So what am I going to do with all that goodwill? Anybody, you see Goodwill uh, advertised lately? Hey, Goodwill for sale. No, right? Uh, what about patents, copyrights, trademarks? You could sell those. You could. Uh, the problem is, what's the value on them? And can you get full market value in the short amount of time that you're going to be trying to sell this stuff? The answer is probably not. And so the probability of recovery given default for the firm with lots of intangible assets is lower. As a result, the ratings on its bonds will be lower, even though both firms have identical default risk. Okay, now who's issuing these ratings? Uh, we've got, so they, they tried to start a fourth one. I didn't forget the name of it because, you know, it probably is just doomed to failure. Uh, but the three big ones, actually there's two big ones and a minor one. 
But we've got S&P, which is short for standard and poor. It's the same people the S&P 500 is named after. We have Moody's. And then we have Fitch. Fitch is, right? And so S&P, Moody's, and then Fitch. OK, so these people, they will issue ratings. Now, if it's a big company and a big bond issue, all three of these bond rating it companies will rate the bonds because they all want to be seen playing on these big bond issues. But what if you're a small company or a small town? Do you think you, these people will rate your bonds just for fun? No, they require to be paid. And so we end up with a similar situation that we did with the auditor where there's a potential conflict of interest. Because if you are paying to have your bonds rated, you're going to ask two questions when S&P, Moody's, and Fitch come to call. The first question is, what do you think my bonds should be rated? And the second question is, how much are you going to charge me? And so we have uh, you know, the highest rating, middle rating, low rating. Let's just make it three ratings for now. If two of them come in and say they'll give you a high rating, and the third comes in and says they'll give you a medium rating, uh, what's, what's happened now? Well, we've elimin we eliminate the medium from contention, right? And then what we do is we ask, how much are you going to charge me? And you just take the lower cost of the remaining two. Now, what does that mean for the rating agencies? There is a conflict of interest because they, in order to get the business, what did they have to tell you? We're going to rate your bonds highly. In fact, if you roll back to the mortgage crisis back in 2008-2009, S&P and all of these people were out there slapping AAA ratings, which we're going to see is the top, AAA ratings on these absolute piles of manure that were called collateralized mortgage obligations. And when they stood before the United States Senate to answer for what they had done, they said, oh yeah, we had no idea how to judge the risk on those bonds. So we just made them all AAA. Does that sound like a group of people you can trust? No, absolutely not. Now, why were they doing that? They were making money like crazy from raiding these collateralized mortgage obligations. So, what am I trying to get across to you? There's this conflict of interest. Why would you still want your bond to be raided knowing what you know about bond rating outfits? Well, it's just like audited financial statements. You can trust audited financial statements more than you can trust non-audited financial statements. And I would rather buy a rated bond than a non-rated bond. So is that still legal for them to do that? Because it is a conflict. I mean, it's an obvious conflict of interest. Oh. Of course, after that, did they, did they regulate it? Well, that? so there was some talk about that. But when you get into that situation, in order to get where there's no conflict of interest, what do you have to do? You have to get the taxpayers to be paying to have all these bonds rated. Do you, as a taxpayer, want to bear that burden? No. And, and the other thing is this. When governments get involved, for those of you who are from outside the United States, when the government gets involved, and that means a bureaucrat is making a decision, uh, how does that decision likely get made? Is it based on the merits and everything is on the up and up? In Mexico, if the government were rating the bonds and I wanted a good bond rating, what would I do? That's what we do here. What's that? We slip an envelope across. Yeah! <laughs> Are you from Mexico? No. Oh, sorry, where are you from? Guatemala. Guatemala, okay, if you were in Guatemala and you wanted to get a bond rated highly by the government, what would you do? If you want the government to do anything for you in Guatemala, what do you do? You're telling me Guatemala is perfectly uncorruptible? Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, really corrupt, right? Does that make sense? Okay, this is the other reason why we can't do that is because suddenly now you're going to have these government bureaucrats who make like $70,000 a year living in mansions. Well, where do they get the money? Oh, I'm sure they just invest it wisely. Right. right? Okay. Let's see, where were we? Oh, uh, so we were talking about S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. I still want my bonds rated, and here's why. I'll give you an example. My friend Janet was the director of treasury for city utilities. 
And when they built the new a new unit on the power plant out on the southwest part of town, they needed to borrow money to do it. So they were going to issue some bonds. And when she's talking to the investment banker that's helping her out, he says, you should pay to get the bonds rated. And she said, why would I pay to get the bonds rated? And he said, because even though everyone in Springfield knows that City Utilities is a solid, financially uh, in good shape firm, not everybody does. And by the way, do you think people in New York City even know that Springfield, Missouri exists? Other than our appearance on The Sopranos, when uh, the mafia boss was here in the federal medical facility, that's the only thing those people know about us, right? And so when you say City Utilities, Springfield, Missouri, they're like, I don't know. How can I get them to be interested in buying my bonds? I get them rated by S&P, Moody's, or Fitch. Right? Okay. Now let's talk about the different ratings tiers. And we're going to see that there are a boatload of different ratings, but basically you can break them down into two groups. This top group is called investment grade. And the bottom is called junk. The bottom is called junk. Now, does junk sound good? No, junk doesn't sound good. And so, uh, in the 1980s, people, like this, the guy's name is Michael Milken. And he says, wait a minute, these junk bonds are correctly priced for the risk. Therefore, they have a high yield to, they got, they've got to have a high yield to maturity because of the risk. He says, instead of calling them junk bonds, why don't we call them high yield bonds? Do I have any marketing people in there? Which sounds better to you, the junk bond or the high yield bond? Oh, high yield, yeah, that sounds really good, right? And so that's the first thing. The second thing is that Michael Milken says, wait a minute. Well, there's a limited market out there right now for junk bond or of junk bonds because every junk bond at that point was called a fallen angel. A fallen angel. Now, what does that mean? People didn't used to issue junk bonds. They issued investment grade bonds and then the bonds would become junk bonds because the company fell into hard times, right? And so those would fall from being investment grade to being fallen angels. But what Milken figured out, the true genius of Michael Milken, is he says, wait a minute, we could issue uh, junk bonds that are original issue junk. They're junk from day one. And as long as the yield of maturity is correct, people will still buy them. Does that make sense? And so basically, he opened up an entirely new debt market there. And you can see what happened in the 1980s as a result, lots of mergers and acquisitions. Why? Because funds were available through these junk bonds in order to be able to make those acquisitions. Okay, now let's walk through these different ratings tiers. Is that the junk bond thing? Is that what led to the whole Morris thing eventually? No, two different problems. Two different problems. So I would call the mortgages uh, that were packaged into those collateralized mortgage obligations, they were junk or trash or garbage, uh, but not the same thing. Let's take a, take a look at the bond ratings here. So, uh, widely recognized that this is the, how the matchup happens between uh, Moody's and S&P. And so you can see that S&P's top rating is big A, big A, big A. And Moody's is big A, little a, little a. And then we have uh, the Moody's is big A, little a, S&P is big A, big A. And then, uh, you, so you think, wow, I've got this figured out. So when I get down to S&P being big B, big B, big B, that means that Moody's is going to be big B, little b, little b. Wrong. It's big B, little a, little a. Why? I have no idea. But everyone agrees this is how they match up. And then just like your plus minus grading system, there are steps in between here. So you could have a triple A minus, you could have a double A plus that would be directly below the triple A minus and so forth. Okay, anything up here in green or blue is investment grade. 
anything up here in green or blue is investment grade. And so your lowest investment grade rating would be B, 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 B minus. And using the S&P side, B, 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 B minus. If it's B, B plus, it would be junk. It would be junk. By the way, uh, if you're colorblind, green, blue, colorblind, uh, the top four are investment grade. And the rest of them are all uh, junk. Now, as we move on down here, we can see that they are still linked up right up until we get to the bottom. <clears throat> S&P has a D rating. Those bonds would be included with the C rating at Moody's. Those bonds would be included with the C rating. Now, what's special about those bonds? Those bonds have already been defaulted on. The D stands for default. Those bonds have already been defaulted on. Would you buy a bond that had already been defaulted on? He says yes, and he's right. Why? Uh, so it would give you a claim to recover against their assets? Oh, very good. Let's ask this question. If you're trying to take over a healthy company, what do you buy? It's stock or it's bonds? Stock. The stock. If you're trying to take over a sick company, what do you buy? It's stock or it's bonds? The bonds. It's called vulture capitalism. Vulture capitalism. What's a vulture? Scavenger. A scavenger. So it's a bird that goes around eating dead things. If, uh, so some of you might go out to Vegas on spring break and you decide to take a side trip through Death Valley. The car breaks down and you're out walking in your high-heeled shoes that you wore to the casino. And there you are, and you notice the vultures start to circle you. What does that mean? They think you're gonna die. They think you're gonna die. And what do you think? I'm not feeling that bad. Now, who do you think knows better? The vultures. The vultures. It's their job every day, right? This is your first time. Okay, now, the vultures know better. So, what is vulture capitalism? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to look for sick or struggling companies. Sick or struggling companies that are in an industry that is okay, otherwise okay, they, their business is otherwise okay, they've just been driven into the ground by bad management. They've just been driven into the ground by bad management. And my favorite example is Hostess, the company that makes Twinkies. You guys know about Twinkies? If, if, you're, if you're not an American, you need to go down to the store and get a box of Twinkies just once. Don't eat them all at once because they'll make you really sick. But you go down there, eat the Twinkies. Uh, so here's, here's the deal. Hostess, they're making this product that every American knows and pretty much loves. And then, uh, but they, they've made some really bad decisions. They have not invested in R&D to come up with new things to sell. And they've also signed some very stupid labor contracts. So, for example, Hostess was making both bread and Twinkies. And they had a labor contract with the Teamsters that said that bread and Twinkies cannot be delivered on the same truck. And so what does that mean? It means you've got two Hostess trucks visiting every supermarket and convenience store on the route. Is that efficient? No. And so it chews through a lot of money. Another thing that they were doing is they were failing to invest to upgrade their facilities. And so they were very labor dependent. They weren't automating anything. And by the way, do you think there are a lot of jobs in the Twinkie plant that people really don't want to do? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to get people to, get people to want to work right next to the oven and, and chuck the Twinkies out, right? And so it's better to automate those things. Now, the, the company is getting closer and closer and closer to bankruptcy, and there starts to be a panic among Americans. What was the panic? Does anyone remember? They were going to have Twinkies. Oh, my goodness! And so there was like a great Twinkie run. Yeah, and the, the shelves were just like stripped bare of Twinkies. I told my wife. I said, undoubtedly, Twinkies will be back. Because it's a good business, they just screwed it up. 
Someone is going to do vulture capitalism. And sure enough, someone bought up the bonds at pennies on the dollar. And then, as soon as, as the hostess croaked its last, then they took over all those assets. Now, here's the cool thing about bankruptcy and union contracts. The old contracts are now null and void. And so they, they uh, reach out to the former employees and they say, hey, you're uh, more than welcome to apply for the job. And then they're like, well, I want my old union pay and, and wages back. And it's like, sorry, pal, that's gone, right? If you guys want a union and a contract, you're going to have to form a new one. And you're going to have to negotiate. And by the way, the contract terms won't, won't be nearly as sweet. Does that make sense? OK. At what point do, does a default in bond but at what point is it no longer punchable? Oh, that's a good question. Now, I don't know the answer. I'm going to look the answer up. But here's what I would guess is after the bankruptcy proceedings have closed. That would be my guess. That's a good So He used a word there that you guys might not even know. What was the word? Fungible. Fungible. It sounds fun. What is it? I mean, we're fun. Oh, that you can sell it, right? right? So a fungible asset is one that you can sell. And so some, some assets are not fungible, like goodwill. Right? So when would you buy these bonds? Before they go bankruptcy or after? Oh, oh, yeah. What I would be doing is Maybe. watching them getting really, really close to bankruptcy, and I would buy them uh, just right before the bankruptcy. I would buy them at the last possible date that they were fungible. Now, the problem is this. If I'm having this plan, what someone else might be planning to. But say, once they go bankrupt, the bonds the bond don't work anymore. Except for they give me the ability to take control of the assets. Okay. That's worth gotcha. something, right? Gotcha. Yeah, that's how vulture capitalism works. If you're going to take over a healthy company, you buy the stock. If you're going to take over a sick company, you buy the bonds and wait for it to die. Now, can you do this with every company out there? The answer is no. A lot of times, companies go bankrupt because their business model is no longer viable. So if you roll back to the mid-1990s, and, uh, and Mr. Nylon's old enough to remember this, uh, when you got on an airplane in the mid-1990s and you looked in the seat back in front of you, uh, there was the inflate magazine and what else was there? Oh, the barf bag? The barf bag. But there was also something called SkyMall. Oh, yeah, SkyMall, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let me paint a picture for you, for you youngsters. Back in 1995, uh, we didn't have mobile devices. If you wanted to read something on the plane, it was either the stupid in-flight magazine, which is always lame, or do I really want to know about Beyonce's hometown? Probably not. Uh, or there was SkyMall. That was a cool magazine. It was. It was full of things you absolutely did not need. Didn't need, but they were cool guys. They were cool, <laughs> all right. Okay, now the other thing you need to know about uh, in the 1990s is there were these phones in the back of airplane seats. And you could take the phone and swipe your credit card, and for like $10 a minute, you could call your mom or your boss, or toll free, you could call Michelle at SkyMall. Okay, now let's walk through this. You check in for your long flight, it's delayed, you read the paperback you bought at the bookstore, you get on the plane, you've blown through the uh, in-flight magazine, and now you're into SkyMall. By the way, you're also drinking because it's like you're on the plane, and it's the 90s. And then you get to page 67, and they have a life-size statue of Sasquatch. <laughs> You guys know what Sasquatch is? Uh, Bigfoot. Like Bigfoot. Uh, so like the missing link, you know, between humanity and other creatures. Anyway, so Sasquatch. And you're like, damn, that's cool. And so what do you do? You pick up the phone and you call Michelle, and Michelle's just so nice, and she helps you to arrange everything. And but you've had so many drinks, you forget. Six weeks later, you're on another business trip, and your wife calls you at the hotel, and she says. Big crate appeared today. And you're like, what? She's like, yeah, it's over six feet tall. And you're like, uh huh? And then you remember you ordered Sasquatch from SkyMall. Okay, now that's how, that was a viable business model back then. 
Now, let's talk about what's happened in the meantime. Do airplanes still have those phones on the back of the seat? No. Uh, and jet fuel, the price went up, and the airlines started chucking things to get rid of weight. What did they chuck? Sky home. And then also, what about electronic devices on airplanes? Do people need to browse through SkyMall now because they're bored? No. Do people still drink on airplanes? Yes. Okay, so at least one part of their business model still fits. Okay, now, it was so funny though, because I saw SkyMall CEO, this has been a few years back, and he's like, he's walking through all these problems, and you can tell he's being brutally honest, and then he says, but we still think it's a going concern meaning that he thinks that the business can be viable going forward. You could tell by the look on his face he knew he was lying, right? Now, SkyMall's going bankrupt. Do I do vulture capitalism on it? No, let it die, right? Because it's a dead business model. This has created destruction. This is how economies move forward. Sometimes a SkyMall has to die so an Amazon can arise in its place. Does that make sense? I mean, really, I mean, SkyMall, I mean, what kind of asset would they have had anyway? Well, they had, you know, the goodwill. <laughs> yeah, right. That's a good question. And I had absolutely, so they, uh, definitely they had a warehouse, a distribution center, something like that, but uh, really they had the brand. Okay, Hostess was still a viable brand, right? Huge value to that brand. What about SkyMall? No. Questions about bond ratings? I don't know what's going on with my camera mount today. There we go. Okay, now we're moving on to different types of bonds. And we're going to talk about government bonds. And the top set are federal government bonds. We're talking about the United States of America here. The federal government is our central government, the one that's over all the states. And they issue some things that we've already talked about in here. Treasury bills. One of the things you need to know about treasury bills is that they are a discount only loan. You buy those at a discount below the face value and then it's the capital gain up to face value is where you get your return. Okay, and usually we're talking about three months there. And then we have treasury notes. And remember we said notes were greater than one year up to and including <coughs> 10 years. Now, treasury notes do have coupons. Treasury notes do have coupons. And so they don't have to sell at a, as, a, as deep a discount. In fact, they can sell at a premium. Then we have treasury bonds. Treasury bonds have greater than 10 years original issue maturity, up to 30 years. We've discussed in the past going up to 40 or 50 years on those bonds but it's never come to pass. So the 30-year United States Treasury bond is the longest one you can get. Now, all of those, uh, all of those government bonds, the federal government bonds, are free of state taxes. In other words, the federal government says to the tax, you can't tax the interest or the capital gain from these bonds. That's, that's fine. But, you have to pay federal taxes on them. So the federal government, even though it's going to prevent the state from taxing you, they're going to tax you on your income from those bonds. Now, what about the other kind of bonds that we're talking about? So everything beneath the federal level, we're, going, we're talking about states, cities, counties, even special districts like school districts and sewer and water districts, they can issue what are called municipal bonds. They can issue what are called municipal bonds. And these are free of federal tax. So the federal government promises not to tax the income from these municipal bonds. And depending on what state you live in, you may not have to pay tax on the interest you receive from them either. So usually this is the way it works. If I live in Missouri and I buy a municipal bond for a Missouri entity, then I don't pay federal tax or state tax. But my mother-in-law, who lives in Arkansas, if she bought that bond, she would have to pay Arkansas state tax. But what if she bought a municipal bond from Arkansas? She wouldn't have to pay state tax on that one. And so it's basically trying to attract local money to invest in these local municipal bonds. It's a state government thing. Okay. 
Now that means that municipal bonds have a tax advantage that taxable bonds do not have. So what is that going to do to our required yield to maturity? If you remember our discussion last time, we said that people are interested in after-tax return. They're interested in the amount of money that they're going to get that they're going to be able to spend. So, what does this tax-free status do to the required yield to maturity? As a result, it is lower. It's lower. Remember what we said about those euro bonds where the people weren't paying taxes on them and so then uh, they required lower yield and maturity on them? Uh, it's even more straightforward here with municipal bonds because you don't have to break any laws in order to get the tax break. So we say that the interest on a, a required interest on a municipal bond is equal to the uh, interest required on an otherwise identical taxable bond. In other words, has the same uh, coupons, same time to maturity, same risk, same everything else except for it's not a municipal bond, it's taxable. Multiplied by one minus big T, where big T is the investor's marginal tax rate. By the way, the marginal tax rate is the rate we pay on the very next dollar, right? And so if I go out there, let's say my, my tax rate, my marginal tax rate is 25%. Uh, it means that for any money that I get off of this bond, I'm going to be paying 25% taxes. So I'll be keeping 75%, 1 minus 0.25, right? And so as a result, I would be willing to buy a municipal bond if it pays more than 75% of the otherwise identical taxable bond. So let's say that the identical taxable bond is yielding 10%, is paying a uh, required return of 10%. What would the municipal bond equivalent be? 7.5%, because it's 10 times 1 minus 0.25. At that point, you are indifferent between a 7.5% municipal bond and a 10% taxable bond because they're going to bring you exactly the same amount of after-tax return. Now let's talk about who would be interested. In the United States, uh, you pay 0% on the first certain amount of money that you make. And after that, then you start to pay, let's say, 10% on the next tax bracket. And then you pay 15%. And then you're up to 20%. And it goes all the way up to, I think, 39.6% or something like that. Now. Let's talk about different people and where they're at. People with high incomes have high marginal tax rates. As a result, that marginal tax rate, T, is higher. 1 minus T is lower. You don't have to offer as much return on a municipal bond to attract high income people as you do low income people. So. This is a true story. 2007, my wife and I moved here. And back in 2007, people still had landline telephones, right? And one day, our landline telephone rings, and I pick it up, and it's a guy from Edward Jones. You guys know what Edward Jones is? What's Edward Jones? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, a brokerage, right? And the guy for, says, this is so-and-so from Edward Jones. Uh, is this Dr. Haggard? And I say, yes, and he says, I would like to talk to you about municipal bonds. I cover the mouthpiece and I turn around to my wife and I say, honey, it's Edward Jones. They think we're rich enough to care about municipal bonds. We've made it. And then I say, no thanks, and I hang up. <laughs> okay, now, why he, he figured out from my zip code and my job, in fact, my salary is public information, right? He's like, whoa, I'll bet I can pull this guy into municipal bonds. Now, what he didn't realize is that my charitable contributions and my pre-tax savings are so high that my marginal tax rate is actually too low for me to care, right, about this sort of thing. Because there are enough people with higher marginal tax rates to buy all these municipal bonds, you don't have to uh, offer higher and higher rates. By the way, how do you get more and more people attracted to these things? You have to hire, raise the rates so you're attracting now a lower tax bracket. 
what if your tax bracket was basically 0%? So there are a lot of, go ahead. No, that's fine. What if your tax bracket is 0%? So it's equal to? Yeah. At that point, I am indifferent between the two, right? There is no reason I would buy a municipal bond if I wasn't paying any taxes. So things like pension funds, they don't pay taxes. So do you think they're interested in municipal bonds? Absolutely not. Um, in the United States, you get tax deductions for all sorts of things. My brother-in-law, he's got a good job, but he's also got like a bunch of kids. And the government allows you to subtract a certain amount for every kid. And by the time he subtracts all that out, it brings him down into the 0% marginal tax rate. Would he be interested in municipal bonds? No. Now, one other thing we want to talk about here is we want to rearrange this formula and come up with something called the taxable equivalent yield. And the taxable equivalent yield is I sub t. And if I divide both sides there by 1 minus t, what I get is the municipal bond rate divided by 1 minus t. And so that is what we refer to as our taxable equivalent yield. Those are supposed to be dots. Taxable equivalent yield. Should both of those formulas be on your note sheet? Yeah. Should the term taxable equivalent yield be on your note sheet? Yeah. In other words, I could say, uh, here is a municipal bond. It's paying 7%, and the person's tax rate is 30%. What would the taxable equivalent yield be? It would be 7% divided by 1 minus 0.3, which is 0.7. 7% divided by 0.7 gives me 10%. And so that's how I would calculate the taxable equivalent yield. And in the end, what do we want? What we want is the thing that puts the most money in our pockets after taxes. And so, uh, what I would do on an exam, are you listening? What I would do on an exam is I would give you a taxable bond and a municipal bond, and I'd say your tax rate is 28%. Which one do you prefer? Right? And so the easiest thing to do is to take the municipal bond rate, multiply it times 1 minus 0.28, but sorry, you take the municipal bond rate and divide it by 1 minus 0.28 and see if that is higher than the taxable bond rate. If it is, then you go ahead and take that bond, the municipal bond. Or what if you could take the taxable bond rate and multiply it by 1 minus 0.28 and if the municipal bond rate was higher than that amount, then you would take the municipal bond. Does that make sense? So you can, you can check it either way. I can tell we're getting really close to spring break. You guys are looking glazed. Okay. Now let's talk about zero coupon bonds. We talked about zero coupon bonds a little bit. Um, what's the coupon rate on zero coupon bonds? Zero. zero. How do we price them? We price them as semi-annual coupon bonds. So we price them assuming that they pay two zero coupons per year. And we said the reason that is, is because the bond traders don't come up through finance, they come up through the mail room and, and other places like that. Okay, now, all of the principal and interest to get paid back at maturity, so these things have to sell at a discount, as long as the expected return is positive. As long as the return is positive, <coughs> now you say, why in the world would anyone buy a bond expecting negative yield to maturity. Let's roll back to 2008, 2009. The world was falling apart. You didn't know which bank was going to fold next. And even if you lived in a country where you had deposit insurance, uh, it only covers a limited amount. Right? They, they raised it from 100,000 100, up to 250,000, but there are still people out there with a boatload of money that needed a place to park it. And so your choices are either accept big truckloads of cash at your house, which I don't recommend, or you can invest in government bonds. 
And so actually so many people were buying up the government bonds of, at the time, Germany, because Germany was actually the safest country in the world financial-wise, and they were buying up the bonds of Germany. They pushed the price of those bonds, those zero-coupon bonds, they pushed it up to over face value. They were willing to accept a loss just to keep from losing the majority of their money. As a result, we actually saw, for the first time in my life, we saw zero coupon bonds selling at a premium. Is that normal? No. Typically, we're looking at a positive rate of return, and so those bonds are going to sell at a discount. They have to because they don't have any coupons. You may also hear them called zeros or deep discount bonds. You can have discount bonds that actually have positive coupons as long as the coupons are not enough to uh, satisfy the investor's demand yield maturity wise. But if it's a zero, we're pretty darn sure that it's not going to be enough to satisfy, so it's going to be a discount bond. Next kind of bond we're going to talk about is the floating rate bond. If you remember, I told you that one of the things that stays the same over the life of the bond is the coupon rate. That's true for everything except for the floating rate bond. And the floating rate bond is going to have a coupon rate that varies based on some underlying benchmark rate, usually the 10-year United States Treasury. It's going to be going on that rate plus then something added on. And why you have to add something on? Because the 10-year U.S. Treasury is default risk-free, but the bonds of companies are not. And so these companies are going to say, well, we'll do the 10% or we'll do the 10-year treasury plus, say, 2% add-on to make it interesting for people who are willing to take risk. Now, what does that mean? It means as interest rates go up, so does the coupon rate of the bond. And as the coupon rate goes up at the same rate as, say, the yield maturity, then that's going to keep these bonds near face value. And so these floating rate bonds, unless there's something weird about the company itself, unless the company gets in trouble, these floating rate bonds should always sell for close to face value. As a result, the interest rate risk is taken off of the bond holder and put on to the bond issuer. Remember, when you're a bond holder, if interest rates go up, what happens to the value of your bond? It goes down. But if I've got a floating rate bond and interest rates go up, do I care? No, my bond's still worth roughly face value because the coupon rate is moving up and down with the yield of maturity. Now, if I'm taking the risk off of the bond holder and putting it onto the bond issuer, that means the bond holder is going to require a lower rate of return because it's not as risky for them. They're still having to bear default risk, but they're not having to bear interest rate risk. And so as a result, the company can borrow for cheaper. The consumer analogy here is the adjustable rate mortgage. In typical times, the fixed rate mortgage is going to be here, and then an adjustable rate will be lower. And the reason is we are taking the interest rate risk off of the lender and putting it onto the borrower. Since that borrower is now footing more of the risk, they are going to, what, let me put this the other way. Since the lender is, is now handling less of the risk, it's onto the borrower, the borrower is not going to pay as much because the risk is reduced for the lender, they can loan out a lower amount of money. Now, let's talk about adjustable rate mortgages. When are they good, when are they bad? The average American, before 2009, do you know how long they stayed in the house? Four years. Yeah, so it, it's in the single digit years, right? And so we're talking, uh, my wife and I moved every three years until we moved here. Every, at least every three years. And so as a result, did it ever make sense for us to take on a fixed rate mortgage? Now, if you know you're going to be moving around, and then it might make sense to take on the fixed rate mortgage because they're usually locked up for the first three years or whatever, right? It makes sense. What about when you move to what you're hoping to be the job that you retire from? 
and you get a fixed rate, and that's exactly what I've got now. Does that make sense? Okay, so floating rate bonds uh, reduce the borrowing cost, but they increase the interest risk for the bond issuer. Now let's talk about income bonds. Income bonds only pay coupons uh, when the net income meets some threshold level. Let's say $100 million. If net income is $100 million, then we pay the coupon. Now, this to me is like your friend who asked to borrow $100. And you say, when are you going to pay me back? And they say, when I get a job. Would you loan them money? No. Who entirely controls when they get a job? They do, right? They entirely control when they get a job. Now, let's think about how that matches up here. Who has tremendous discretion over the accounting at the firm? The managers. Do you think that the, uh, the net income would come in something like, it'd be like 99.99, they're like, oh, missed it again, sorry, you're not getting your coupon, right? Do you think scumbag managers might manipulate earnings to achieve that outcome? Yeah, and they've got a lot of latitude for the generally accepted accounting principles to do that. So as a result, the income bond, I just stay away from them. In fact, one of my colleagues in finance, one of the more famous ones, he said these things had the smell of death about them. The last big issuance of income bonds was back in the 1970s when American railroads were going bankrupt. And this was one of their last gasp kinds of financing. By the way, why did American railroads go bankrupt in the 1970s? because we built the interstate highway system in the 50s and the 60s. And now stuff starts going by truck. Who needs trains? Trains take a long time and you have to wait for your crap forever. The truck just takes it. In fact, the truck takes it straight to the store, right? Does the train take the stuff? No. Okay. So these railroads were on their last gasp with their dying breath and, and they're like, hey, wait a minute, give me one more chance. And they come up with the income bond. I would not buy them if I were you. Then we have convertible bonds. Remember, convertible or uh, regular bonds are straight debt. They have no equity component to them at all. But convertible bonds, you can actually convert these bonds into equity. Now, here's the reason that that might be attractive. Bonds have absolutely no upside. Bonds have no upside. Let me just tell you what I mean here. If times are kind of rough at the company, they're going to pay the coupon. Times get a little better at the company. What happens? They pay the coupon. Times get great at the company. What do they do? They pay the coupon. Do you see that bonds don't have any upside? The only thing the bonds have potentially is downside. If the company defaults, then you've got some downside there. What, though, exposes you to both the upside and the downside of the company? Equity. Equity. Right? Equity does. And so here's what you do. You buy the convertible bond and you hold on to it until the bond is worth more converted into equity than it is as the bond itself. And then if you decide you want to cash out, what you do is you, you wait until the last minute. You convert the bond then. And then you go ahead and sell the shares. Here's why you don't convert the bond and then hold on to the shares. What could happen to the value of the shares? Yeah, they could go down. And in fact, they could go down so low that you wish you could go back to having the bond. Can you go backwards and convert the other way? No, it's a one-way trip. And that's why I will not convert a convertible bond until I am ready to sell the stock. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, now. What do you think, all else equal, you've got two otherwise identical bonds, one of them has this potential lottery ticket nailed to it, and the other one is just straight debt. Which one of those do you think requires a higher yield to maturity? It's got to be, well, so the, the low, actually it's going to be a lower yield of maturity on the one with the lottery ticket, because not Could only are you getting, risk. Uh, actually it's lower risk. Remember we said there's no upside to uh, bonds, but you have the potential to take advantage of the upside if you can convert it into stock. Okay, so all else equal, 
people will prefer the convertible bond because it's got this additional source of value. By the way, how do I know that this thing has value? Will people pay cash for lottery tickets? Yeah. And so this, this call or this uh, convertibility option is actually kind of like a lottery ticket. As a result, the yield to maturity for convertible bonds is lower than an otherwise identical straight bond. The yield to maturity for convertible bonds is lower than an otherwise uh, straight bond. Otherwise identical straight bond. Okay, next time we will start out talking about put bonds and then we will jump into stocks. I promise stocks will not take as much time as bonds have. Questions? <coughs>